Well, class, welcome to episode six of our Math 1050 College Algebra class. I'm Dennis Allison of the Math Department at Utah Valley State College. Uh, this episode covers two major topics. First of all, we'll talk about quadratic functions, uh, some important formulas related to quadratic functions, and we'll look at some, some useful applications that I think are rather interesting. Then we'll switch to another topic and talk about the algebra of functions, and in particular, the composition of two functions that becomes important for our next episode. Well, uh, to begin with, let's look at uh, what I mean by a quadratic function. Uh, if I have a function f of x of this form, let's say mx plus b, you remember in a previous episode we referred to this as a linear function. But if I have a function of this form where there's a second power involved, ax squared, I think I'll say plus bx plus c. Now, this is a quadratic expression and we refer to this as a quadratic function. And uh, quadratic functions have graphs that are, that are uh, parabolas. Now, let's just take an example of a quadratic function that we've actually seen uh, a couple episodes back. Suppose I wanted to graph uh, this function, f of x equals uh, x minus 2 squared minus 3. Now, you may recall that this is actually a transformation of the function f of x equals x squared. And f of x equals x squared has uh, three target points. They were at, they were at 0, 0, 1, 1, and negative 1, 1. And once I plot those three target points, then I can draw the graph by just drawing a uh, parabola that goes through those points. But this is a, this is a transformed, uh, this, this is a transformation of that fundamental graph. What are the changes that I make if I want to graph this, this uh, function? Stephen? Uh, you have to go to the right two and down three. Exactly. We're going to go to the right two because I've subtracted two directly from the x. And the minus 3 on the end says I need to go down 3. So if I graph that one right here, um, let's see what I would do. Let's, let's put our scale on here first of all. This is the x-axis. This is the y-axis. So I'm going to take my origin and move it to a new position. I'm going to go over 2. And I'm going to go down 3. So over 2, down 3, this is my new origin right here. So that point corresponds to the original origin. And my target points say go over 1 and up 1 to the right, go to the left 1 and up 1. And so when I draw my graph, it looks like this. Now, you know, before I go too far on this, where will this function cross the y-axis? I'm going to use this space over here to find my y-intercept so that I can complete this graph. Uh, you may remember that to find the, the y-intercept, I let x be 0. So I'm going to let x be 0. That just means calculate f at 0. And when I plug in a 0 there, I get negative 2 squared minus 3. That's going to be 4 minus 3 or 1. So this graph is going to cross the y-axis at 1, right there. And as it turns, so that's where I'll locate that point. And this is the graph of f. Now, while we're at it, where does it cross the x-axis? Uh, who can tell us how to find the x-intercepts? In fact, first of all, let me ask you, how many x-intercepts does this seem to have? Two. two. Looks like it has two. You know, I bet there's one that's very small but positive. And there's another one over here that's, it looks like it's bigger than 3, the way I've labeled it, but we don't know if my graph is perfectly accurate. Uh, well, you remember, to find the y-intercept, we let x be 0. To find the x-intercepts, I'm going to let y be 0. Now, I'm going to need a little more space for that, so let me just erase all of this on the right-hand side, and I'm going to let y be 0. And y is the same thing as the f of x, so I'm going to let f of x be 0 x minus 2 squared minus 3. Now, one way to solve that would be to multiply this out and then either factor it or use the quadratic formula. But I'll think I'll use the idea of, of uh, completing the square. I'm going to add 3 to both sides. 
let's see, that should be a minus there. And then take a square root on both sides, and I'll take both the positive and the negative square root of 3, because I'm looking for every possible solution. That's what x minus 2 is. It's equal to plus or minus the square root of 3. So x is equal to 2 plus or minus the square root of 3. So I actually have two answers. One of them, I'll call it x number 1, is 2 plus the square root of 3. And the other one, x number 2, is 2 minus the square root of 3. Now, if you find the square root of 3 on your calculator, I think you'll see that the square root of 3 is about 1.7. So x1 here is about 2 plus 1.7 which makes that 3.7. So when I said the x-intercept was a little bit larger than 3, that's, uh, that's fairly accurate. That's about 3.7 right here. The other number we said should be positive, but pretty close to 0. Let's just see. Um, if I substitute in 1.7, an approximation of the square root of 3, that's 2 minus 1.7, and that is 0 0.3. Yes, yeah, so that number should be, well, right about there. I didn't draw my graph quite through it, but that's where it should have been. Uh, you know, the, the problem with the numbers like the square root of 3 is these are irrational numbers, and so as decimals, they extend indefinitely, and they have no pattern to them. So, so when you find the square root of 3 on your calculator, you really don't find it exactly. You find it out to maybe 8 or 10 decimal places, but the last decimal place is rounded off. And this number goes on forever, and there's no pattern. So. Who knows what would be the next digit after the digit you see on your calculator? So it's a lot easier to just call it the square root of 3, and that's considered exact as opposed to using a 1.7, which is an approximation. It's just that when I go to actually plot a number, I need to have something more than this, so, so I did use the approximation in that case. Okay, um, well, with that idea, let's consider a quadratic function, and let's see if we can just guess where its vertex lies without actually drawing the graph. Oh, by the way, the, the word vertex, I'm using the word vertex here. Um, in the graph that I just drew, you remember we said we went over 2 and we went down to negative 3, and I located that lowest point before I, before I drew this parabola. This lowest point, this point where the parabola turns around, that's the vertex. It comes from Greek. It has a Greek origin. Um, so finding the vertex means to find the lowest or the highest point on a parabola. If the parabola is inverted, it would be the highest point. Okay, let's take this function. Uh, I'm going to call this function uh, p of x because it's a polynomial. A quadratic function is a polynomial. Uh, p of x is equal to um, 2 times x plus 4 squared minus 1. Now, if I were going to graph this, I would shift it four units to the left, and I would shift it one unit down. And what does the 2 do to the graph? <coughs> Stretches it vertically. That's going to be a stretch. Yes, we're, we're, going to, we're going to stretch the target points up above uh, the horizontal line through the new origin. So that says that if I were to... Uh, move, let's see, let me draw that a little better. If I were to move from the origin over 4 to the left and down 1, what would be the coordinates of the vertex? Susan. I actually have a question. Oh, okay. Why are you moving it 4 to the left and not 4 to the right? Uh, you see, if you add a 4 directly on the x, then you move it in a negative direction. Now, if I had added 4 on the outside, I would move it straight up. I'd move it in a positive direction vertically. But it's a little tricky when you add a 4 directly to a variable, it moves it in the opposite direction, so I go in the negative direction. Well, I guess the question is, where's the vertex? What are the coordinates of the vertex? Negative 4, negative 1. Negative 4, negative 1. So the vertex, I'll call it point V, is at negative 4, negative 1. And you know, I really didn't have to draw this graph over here. I could have gotten that information directly from the, uh, from the equation. So I'll do one more like this. Suppose I have the quadratic function f of x equals negative 1 half times x plus 2 squared plus 5. Where's the vertex of this quadratic function, of this parabola? Sam, what would you say? I'm not sure. 
Okay, uh, Matt, what would you say? Where's the vertex? Oh, let's see. Vertex would be at a negative two. Negative two, yeah. And positive five. Positive five, because see that says shifted up five units. So if I go to the left two units, that puts me at negative two. And if I go up five units, that puts me at positive five. You notice this coefficient had nothing to do with the location of the vertex. But it does have an effect on the graph. Uh, the negative flips the, par the parabola over and the one half compresses it. So if I were going to move from this new origin where the vertex lies, I would go out one on either side and I would go down one half because it's been compressed and it's been inverted. Okay, so if the quadratic function is given in this form where I have a, a, where I have a binomial squared and a constant, this is sometimes called the, um, the um, uh, uh, standard standard form, uh, I can just pick out what the coordinates of the vertex are. But suppose I have this situation. Let's say I have the quadratic function um, f of x equals x squared minus 6x plus, um, let's say, plus 8. Well, this is a quadratic function. You notice it's in the form it's in the standard form that I gave you earlier, ax squared plus bx plus c. Uh, looks like a is equal to 1, b is equal to negative 6, and c is equal to 8. So the question is, uh, what's the vertex of this, of this parabola? Well, I can't tell in this form, but if I complete the square and get it into that form, I think I could, I could name the vertex. So I'm going to complete the square by separating the x's from the 8. Now, what number would I add right here to complete the square of that trinomial? Uh, Stephen, what would you put? Uh, 36. Oh, wait, 9. Plus 9. Yeah, tell, tell us the rule for deciding how to get a 9 there. Uh, you take half of the uh, middle coefficient right. And square it. Exactly. Uh, first of all, you have to have a 1 on the x squared. If there's a 2 on the x squared, I'd factor out a 2 or somehow move it away from these terms. But there's a 1 there, so everything's fine. I take half of the coefficient of the middle term, half of negative 6 is negative 3, and then Stephen said he squared it and then he got 9. Now, you may ask, well, gee, Dennis, can you just add a 9 in the middle of a problem? Well, you can if you subtract the 9 over there so that these two 9s would cancel if you wanted to go back to the original problem. Of course, we don't want to go back there. I want to go forward because I want to write this as a binomial squared. And on the outside, I have a minus 1. Well, now you notice this looks a lot like what I had up here. So I think I can name the vertex for the function little f. And the vertex is, uh, let's say it's an ordered pair. What would you say it is, Lene? Uh, 3, negative 1. 3, negative 1. <coughs> exactly, 3, negative 1. So I found the vertex by completing the square. Let me do just one more of those since I think maybe a couple examples have to make that clear. This time I'm going to put a coefficient on the x squared. Uh, let's call this function capital P of x, P for polynomial. And let's say this is 2x squared um, minus um, 14x plus plus 5. Okay, the question is, what's the vertex? So I'm going to complete the square, uh, and first of all, I have to get my variables separated from the constant term 5 over here. And I'm not ready to take half the middle coefficient and square it, because I have a coefficient on the x squared other than a 1. So I'm going to factor out a 2 right there, and that says x squared minus 7 in parentheses, there's a plus 5 over here. I'm not factoring a 2 out of the 5. The 2 is only being factored out of the two uh, terms with x's in it. Now, I'll take half this coefficient and square it. Let's see, half of negative 7 is negative 7 over 2. And then I have to square it. And when I square it, I get 49 over 4. So the number I need to add on here is 49 over 4. So I have to counterbalance that by putting something on the other side, on, on the other side of the 5. Well, you know, I, I, I'm putting in not 49 over 4. I'm putting in 2 times 49 over 4. And if I double 
49 over 4, I get 49 over 2. So what I've actually added in here is 49 over 2. So on the other side, I'm going to subtract 49 over 2. And uh, if I factor this trinomial, this will be x. There's a minus in the middle. And if I take the square root of 49 over 4, I get 7 over 2. And the square of this binomial is the trinomial that you see right above it, plus. Now, I need to simplify the two constants over here. Let's get them both over 2. 10 over 2 minus 49 over 2. So this is 2 times x minus 7 halves squared minus 39 over 2. Well, it, this is a little messier than the last problem because I have fractions in it, but it, we still have, we could still name the vertex. The vertex lies at, oh, let's see, this tells me I have to shift the graph to the right, 7 halves. This says I have to shift the graph down, 39 halves. So the vertex is at 7 over 2, negative 39 over 2. If you want, you could say 3 and a half, comma, negative 19 and a half. But I think it's, it's more compact to write these as what they call improper fractions right here. That's the vertex. Well, I've done two problems basically the same way. This one was a little bit longer because I had to contend with the coefficient of 2 there. And also because I had fractions involved, makes it look a little bit more complicated. There's a shortcut to this process. Let's start over again. And I'm going to go through this procedure one more time. But I'm going to use variable coefficients. And I'll end up with a formula that will save me all that work. Suppose we have the function f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. The only difference is now I'm using variables for the coefficients rather than particular coefficients. Uh, I'm going to complete the square in this expression. And so I have f of x equals the quantity ax squared plus bx and the c I'll move to the outside, just like I did in the last example with the plus 5. Uh, what am I going to have to do before I decide what goes in this position? Factor out the a. Have to factor out the a, right. So if I factor out the a, just like in the previous example, I factored out a 2. This will be x squared plus b over a x. And over here is plus c. You see, when you say factor out the a, that means you have to divide by a inside. So I get a 1x squared, and I get b over a times x. Well, this is looking a little nasty, but actually it works out rather nicely. If I take half the b over a, I'll do that over here on the side. If I take half of b over a, I'm going to square that to put in the third position. Let's see, half of b over a is b over 2a. And when I square that, I get b squared over 4 a squared, b squared over 4a squared. So I have to decide what to put on the right-hand side of c to balance that. Well, I'm not putting in just b squared over 4a squared. I'm putting in a times that. And a times that is, let's see, that a would cancel. That's b squared over 4a. So what I've actually added here is the product a times this rational expression. So I need to subtract that off. Subtract off b squared over 4a. You notice that doesn't look exactly the same as what I put here, but it's because I'm replacing this product. OK, let's use this space now to, to factor our trinomial. I have a times a quantity plus over here, c minus b squared over 4a. Um, let's see, can anyone tell me how you'd factor the trinomial? Stephen. x plus b over 2a. Oh, x, uh, x plus b over 2a. And uh, I'm going to write this one more time, and I'm going to put this over a common denominator over here. a times x plus b over 2a squared plus 4ac minus b squared all over 4a. Uh, you know, this looks a little bit like the quadratic formula, except in the quadratic formula, the, the, the uh, discriminant under the square root is b squared minus 4ac. This is 4ac minus b squared. So it's similar. 
And also in the quadratic formula, everything's over 2a. This is, has everything over 4a. Well, my point is this. If I want to find the vertex, the vertex has first coordinate negative b over 2a. That's because this says shift the graph in the opposite direction of the number b over 2a, because I have a plus right here. So I shift it to negative b over 2a. And to find the y coordinate of the vertex, it would be the number, it would be the number over here. Now rather than remembering that, if you want, you can remember that formula, that's fine with me. But rather than remembering that formula, if I want to find the y coordinate of the vertex, I just take the number that comes up here and I substitute it back in for x and I evaluate this expression at whatever that number is. So if you choose to remember this formula for the y coordinate, that's fine. But I think it's easier personally to just take this, substitute it back into f. Let's work an example using this. I'm going to write down my formula right here, and I'll also write down this formula just in case somebody wants to use that at home. Let's see, the, the very first example I worked where I had to complete the square, I think looked like this. I had the function f of x equals x squared minus 6x plus 8. And the formulas uh, I'm using is that for the vertex, there are two coordinates, an x and a y coordinate. The x coordinate is negative b over 2a. And the y coordinate, what I suggested is you go back to the original function f and you evaluate it at negative b over 2a. Now, in a lot of textbooks, the x coordinate of the vertex is called h. So I'm going to put an h there. And the y coordinate of the vertex is called k. So I'm going to put a k there. But as an alternative, I said you could calculate a using the formula 4ac minus b squared over 4a. But somehow that seems sort of complicated to remember. But if you want to use that, you certainly can. OK, let's draw a little line here. And let's see how this works out. I need a value for a. I need a value for b. And I need a value for c. Um, Let's see, Susan, what are the values of a, b, and c in this, in this problem? a is 1, mm -hmm. b is negative 6. Negative 6. And c is 8. c is 8. Yeah, you know my b looks a lot like a 6, so I hope you can see the difference there. Uh, well, to calculate h, let's see, that's negative b over 2a. That's going to be negative, negative 6, which is 6, all over 2a. 2a is 2. And so I get a 3. h is 3. Now, to get k, what I would do would be to take 3, substitute it into the original function. Just plug in a 3. And I get 9 minus 18 plus 8. And that's uh, 17 minus 18 is negative 1. So the vertex is at the point 3, negative 1. And I believe that's the same answer we got just a moment ago when we completed the square to find the vertex. Someone may say, uh, could you work that uh, to calculate k using your formula over here? Well, let's just try that and see. And uh, I'm going to erase this space right here and see if I come up with the same value for, for k. OK, the formula says k is equal to 4ac minus b squared over 4a. So if I substitute in the, our numbers, so I have 4 times 1 times 8 minus negative 6 squared all over 4. And that's 32 minus 36 over 4. Let's see, that's negative 4 over 4 is negative 1. And that's exactly what we got over here was negative 1. So if you would like to remember that formula, that's, that's fine. Or the alternative is to substitute uh, the h value into the function and just calculate the function value there. OK, now, uh, there are applications for this. You know, we're, we're not just finding vertices just because we think they're fun to find. But there are actually applications for this in the real world. So uh, let's go to the uh, next graphic. This is a, uh, let's see, the, the, let's go to the next graphic for the garden problem. Yeah, this is a problem that we talked about last time when we were using a function to model a real life situation. Uh, you remember in the last episode, we described a property owner 
who plan to use 120 feet of fencing to construct a rectangular garden uh, beside her garage. What would be the largest enclosed area if she, in, if she enclosed all four sides? Now, let me, that, that's not exactly the way the problem was stated before. Uh, imagine that I ha have 120 feet of fencing, and let's say the fencing comes on a spool like this, and uh, let's say we're going to make a rectangular garden so that I have to fence all four sides. Then let's say I put X here and I put X here. How much fencing would be left over for the other two sides? I think it'd be 120 minus 2X feet because I've, I've used up 2X. Now, I need to divide that by 2 because I'm going to put half there and half there. So if I divide that by 2, then the length of each one of these sides is 60 minus X. So I'll put 60 minus X up here and 60 minus X down here. So the area of the garden, we'll call it A of X, is length times width. The length is 60 minus X and the width is X. And so the area is 60X minus X squared. Now, um, let's see, for example, what if we said X was 10? Can anyone tell me what is the area of the garden when X is 10, if you plug in a 10 right there? 500? I think it'll be 500. 10 here says 600. 10 here says subtract off 100. It'll be 500 square feet. But on the other hand, what if we say um, that we made this side 20? What would be the area of the garden? Well, if I put in a 20 there, 60 times 20 is uh, 1,200. And 20 squared is 400. 400. So we get a larger garden. It's 800 square feet. Well, this presents the question, of uh, what, would, what should I choose for X if I want to make the area of the garden as large as possible? What's the largest garden I can make? Well, to do that, I need to find where this quadratic function reaches its highest point. You say, does that reach a highest point? Well, this is a quadratic function, and I have a negative on the square. So this is, if I graph this, it would be a parabola that opens down, and that parabola has a highest point. Let's just see how that would, how that would go. Let's see, the, the, the function that we had there was uh, uh, 60x minus x squared. Now, I'm going to turn that around and call it minus x squared plus 60x. And the negative right there gives it away. This is a parabola that opens down. So if I graph this function, the graph would look sort of like this, more or less. And there's a highest point. And this is the area axis the vertical axis, so there must be a maximum area right there. So if I could just determine that number, that would tell me the largest garden I could make. But that means I need to locate the vertex and see what is its y-coordinate. So what is the vertex of this parabola? Well, quickly, the way I could find the vertex is to take negative b over 2a to get h, and then afterwards I'll calculate k. Negative b, that'll be negative 60 over 2a 2 times a, a is negative 1, that'll be a negative 2. So I get 30. Now that tells me the x-coordinate of the vertex. That says we should let x be 30 up here. We should let x be 30 to get the maximum area. And what is the maximum area? Well, that would be the k-coordinate of the vertex, which is a at 30. And that, if I plug in a 30 over here, that's minus 900 plus 1,800 is 900 square feet. So if you want to make the largest possible rectangular garden, uh, the, the largest garden you can make is 900 square feet, and you make this side be 30. By the way, what would be the length of the other side? If this is 30, what would this length be? 30. 30. It would be 30 also, yeah, because see if x is 30, 60 minus 30 is 30. In other words, this is a square is what it is. Now you might say, Dennis, you went all the way around the world to tell us something that we probably would have guessed intuitively. 
that you make a square garden to get the biggest area. I agree. We did, we did go to a lot of trouble to verify that. Now let's change the problem, and I think we get an answer that you wouldn't normally expect. And this is the problem that was actually posed in the last episode. Uh, the landowner is going to put the garden up next to the garage. Uh, you may remember this illustration. I'm going to, uh, let's go to the next graphic, and I think we'll see this on the screen. I'll be drawing this on my board at the same time. Uh, there's the garage. I make a rectangular garden, and I come out X on top, and I come out X on bottom. And uh, we want to figure out what's the biggest possible garden we could make. Okay, let's come back to the green board, and this time I'm going to put all the extra fencing on this side. <coughs> And that was 120 minus 2x feet. Now the area of this garden is x times 120 minus 2x, which is 120x minus 2x squared, which is minus 2x squared plus 120x. Now, I've arranged the terms in this form so I can pick out the A, the B, and the C. C is zero. Um, so to calculate the vertex, H is negative B over 2A, which is negative 120 over 2 times A. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. H is 30. It's the same number I had in the last problem. This should be 30 feet. This should be 30 feet. Now, I could calculate k by substituting in 30 into the original function. I'll find a at 30. And uh, let's, let's use this form up here. If I plug in a 30, that'll be 30 times 120 minus 60, which is 30 times 60, which is 1,800 square feet. Let's see, what was the answer before uh, when we did the square? 900 square feet. 900 square feet. Now we get 1,800 square feet. We actually double the area of the maximum, uh, the maximum area if we put the garden up against the garage wall. You see, basically the reason for that is rather than having to fence this side and this side, I could put all the fencing over here, and now I'm making this twice as long. This ends up being 60 over here, and 30 times 60 is 1,800. So I think now it common sense sort of holes, and it says, just put all the fencing on one side, you can make it twice as long, and so you get twice the area. Okay, uh, another problem that uh, we introduced last time was Galileo's problem of the projectile being thrown from the top of a building. Um, let's go to the next graphic, and we'll see that problem stated again. It says, in the last episode, a ball was tossed upward from the edge of a 240-foot building with a speed of 32 feet per second. How high will it go before it strikes the ground? Okay, let me illustrate that again. You probably remember me drawing something just like this. This building is 240 feet tall, and right here we throw a ball up in the air. We throw something up in the air so that it goes up. It reaches a maximum height, and then it comes back down toward the ground. The question I ask now is, how high will the ball go? Well, now, you know, when I first heard this problem, when I was taking a mathematics course, I thought that would be impossible. How can anyone know how high it'll go? I mean, the thing is moving. Nobody's up there to see how high it'll go. But we can actually do this right here without even performing the experiment. Uh, there was a fundamental formula that we introduced last time from Galileo that said minus 16 t, uh, h of t is minus 16 t squared plus v sub zero t plus h sub zero. If you take a course in physics, you'll hear a lot more about this formula and you'll hear a lot more about Galileo. Um, in this problem, what was v sub zero? That was the initial speed. Uh, 32. 32. 32 feet per second. And what is h sub zero? That was the initial height. 240. 240. So this says h of t is minus 16 t squared plus 32 t plus 240. This is a quadratic function. And I'm looking for the maximum height. It's a maximum because if I were to graph this, this is a parabola that opens down because there's a negative on the square term. It opens down, so it has a maximum height. So to find the maximum height, I'll locate the vertex. First, I'll calculate h, negative b over 2a, 
which is negative 32 over 2 times negative 16. Let's see, now that's negative 32 over negative 32, that's 1. Now, h is the first coordinate, so this represents time. That would be 1 second. So after 1 second, it's at the maximum height. Now what is the maximum height? I'll calculate k, because k is the function value. The function values give heights. I'll find h at 1. If you'd prefer to use that formula that we created, 4ac minus b squared over 4a, be my guest. Go ahead and use it, but I think this is quicker. I'll substitute in a 1 here and here so that I get minus 16 plus 32 plus 240. Uh, let's see, this gives me 16 plus 240 is 256 feet. That's how high the object goes. Now, you might say, Dennis, if I go out, get on top of a building 240 feet tall, and if I can actually throw an object straight up uh, with the initial speed of 32 feet per second, will it actually go 256 feet high? Well, you remember, this function is a model, and we, have to, we haven't taken into account air resistance, wind, things like that. So in a vacuum, this is how high it should go. In real life, it may go just a little bit less than that. But this is a, a fairly close approximation of how high it'll go. If we could do this in a vacuum, for example, there's a vacuum on the moon, there's no atmosphere on the moon, then this should be accurate. But on the moon, I would change that negative 16 to a different negative number because the acceleration of gravity on the moon is different, and that constant is based upon the fact that we're doing this on the Earth. Okay, um, let's see. Let's go to the next topic here, and that is the algebra of functions. So we're going to shift gears. We're going to leave quadratic functions now. You know, you know how to find the vertex of a, of a quadratic function two ways. You know that you can complete the square and uh, write the quadratic function in standard form and pick out the h and the k. Or you can use the formula for h, negative b over 2a, and then calculate the k coordinate. OK, well, the other topic today is the algebra of functions. I'll just write that up here. The algebra of functions, and this is how you combine uh, functions in various ways. And this is related to uh, sort of a preview of what's coming up in the next episode. <clears throat> now, suppose I have two functions. Let's say. I have a function f of x equals um, 2x minus 3. And I have a function g of x, which is um, um, 3x plus 1. And suppose I want to add these two functions together. Well, if I add the two functions together, I would get how many x's there? 5x. I'd get 5x minus and two. minus 2, exactly. Now, this is, this is a new function. And if I wanted, I suppose I could call it uh, h of x. Although, if I give a name like h, that tells me nothing about where the function came from. So instead of h, I'm going to give this function a little bit more complicated name. I'm going to call it the function f plus g. I'll say that really fast, because I'm thinking of this as a single symbol. This is the function f plus g, and it is the sum of f and g. So yeah, that's sort of a natural name for it. <clears throat> now, the reason that's an improvement over saying h of x is because when I see h of x equals um, 5x minus 2, this doesn't tell me anything about the history of the function. It doesn't tell me how I arrived at it. It just says it is. This tells me about the moment. Whereas this statement tells me about how I got this function, that I added two other functions. This doesn't tell me what f and g are, but it tells me that I added two functions to get it. Take, for example, your own name. Uh, let's see, we have here uh, Matt Seavers. Matt Seavers. Now, Matt is his, um, is his given name, but Seavers is his family name. That says that sort of uh, in, in a historical context, he comes from the Seavers, shall we say, the tribe or the clan called Seavers. So it says a little bit about his history. So Matt's his own person, but he belongs to a certain clan or tribe called the Seaver tribe probably the clan of his father, because that's sort of the tradition in American culture anyway, is to take your father's last name. So this tells me a little bit about the history of the function that I've created here. It was formed by taking f and g together. Um, suppose I were to uh, say I'm thinking of a function. I'm going to call it the function f minus g of x. 
Now, this is a single function, but its name is f minus g. It's a hyphenated name. No, actually, it's not hyphenated. That's a subtraction. But uh, sort of like people today have hyphenated names. Well, kind of think of it this way. It's, it's a single name. Uh, what would you guess would be the rule for the function f minus g? Negative x minus 4. Negative x minus 4. Yeah, I think what Stephen was doing is he was subtracting those two. In fact, let me just fill in some details for that. I think he was taking 2x minus 3, and he was subtracting 3x plus 1. And then he reduced that, so he had 2x, take away 3x is negative x, and minus 3 minus 1 is minus 4. Now, you know, sometimes I have students who say, oh, Dennis, I see what you did. You just distributed the x across the f minus g, like f times x minus g times x. Well, that's not really true, because this isn't multiplication. This is a function of x. And we just define f minus g of x. We define it to be f of x minus g of x. But this was not multiplication because this is one function. I'm taking a function of x, and it just happens to look like multiplication, but it's not, that's not actually what's happening. OK, another situation. I'm thinking of yet another function. This function I'm going to call fg of x. fg of x. What do you think that means, fg? The product of the two functions? It's the product, yeah. See, when I write fg, I'm thinking of multiplication. So, so the new function, I'm calling fg, but it's basically f of x times g of x. And if I multiply those together, that would be 2x minus 3 times 3x plus 1. And that would be, uh, let's see, 6x squared minus 7x minus 3. So in this case, I have the product of two linear functions as a quadratic function. We could find the vertex for this, but we don't want to do it. So we'll leave it at the quadratic function. Uh, would that be any different than if I had found f, or rather g f of x? I think it'd be the same thing. By definition, this would be g of x times f of x. But when you multiply these in the reverse order, you get the very same answer. So we'd still get 6x squared minus 7x minus 3. So technically, I'm talking about two different functions that happen to have the same rule. Uh, you can probably guess what's coming next. We've just done the sum of two functions, the difference of two functions, the product of two functions. So now comes the function f slash g of x. Yes, I'm afraid you're right. This is the ratio of the two functions. This is going to be f of x on top and g of x on bottom. So if I see f slash g, it just means take the ratio of those two. And that's going to be um, 2x minus 3 over 3x plus 1. What was the domain of the original function f? All real numbers. All real numbers. What was the domain of the original function g? All, All real, real numbers. numbers. But what's the domain of the function f slash g? All numbers except for negative one-third? Exactly, because we can't divide by zero. And this is zero if you put in a negative one-third for x. You get negative one plus one is zero. So uh, sometimes when you combine two functions and other functions, that you can have a domain that changes. This one has a restricted domain. Its domain, the domain of f slash g, is all real numbers except negative one-third in that case. Um, Let's see here. I'm going to draw a graph of a function that I hope will be fairly easy to read. And I'm going to ask you some questions about it. Um, the graph of the function looks like this. Here's the x-axis. Here's 3. Here's negative 3. I'm running out of room, so I'll say that's 2. And this is negative 2. Now, suppose this function looks like this. Um, it goes diagonally up to this point. That's the point uh, negative 2, 1. Then it goes diagonally down to this point. That's at negative 1. And then it goes horizontally over to here. And then it goes diagonally up right there. Okay, 
That's, that function I'm going to call f. Now I'm going to draw another function on top of this. I'm going to make it dotted so we can tell the difference. That function starts right here at negative 3, and it's dotted all the way over to there. And then that function comes down at a 45 degree angle to 2, and then it goes horizontally. That's supposed to be right on the x-axis, but I'll put it just above it so you can see it, and it goes over to 3. I'm going to call that function g. Now just looking at that graph, what would you say is f at 1? f at 1. Let's see now, this is, here's f at 1. f at 1 should be what Neg number? Negative 1. Negative 1, right. Um, just looking at that graph, what would you say is g at negative 1? Just, I'm just picking negative 1 at random. What Two. is g? Yeah, it looks like at negative 1, if I go up to g, g at negative 1 is 2. Does everyone agree? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, looking at that graph, what would you say is f plus g at 0? You say, well, Dennis, you don't have the graph of f plus g here. Well, f plus g is defined to be f at 0 plus g at 0. You remember that was the definition of f plus g. At 0, I'll take f at 0 plus g at 0. What is f at 0? Negative 1. Uh, looks like that's negative 1. And what is g at 0? 2. g at 0 is 2. So the answer is 1. Uh, f plus g at 0 is 1. What would be g minus f? at negative 2. Let's see, that would be g at negative 2 minus f at negative 2. 1 minus 2. Ah, uh, let's see, g at negative 2, g at negative 2 is, how much did you say, Eleni? Oh, 2. It'd be 2, yeah, this, this one is 2. Minus, what's f at negative 2? f at negative 2. 1. Is 1, yeah. So I, I get 1 there also. It just so happens both these answers turned out to be 1. I didn't know that was going to happen. Uh, let me ask you one more question. What would be um, f slash g at, um, at 3? f slash g at 3. Undefined. Oh, very good. It's undefined. It's kind of a trick question. You see, this is actually f at 3 divided by g at 3. f at 3, f at 3 is 1. g at 3 is 0. And that's undefined. There's no, the, what that says is 3 is not in the domain of f slash g. This is undefined. It has no, it has no value. On the other hand, I think I could have turned it around and said, what is g slash f? at 3, and there would be an answer, because that would be g at 3 divided by f at 3, and that would be 0 divided by 1. Let's see now, can you divide into 0? We can't divide by 0. Can you divide into 0? Sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. And 1 goes into 0, 0 times, so the answer is 0 in that case. Okay, uh, you'll see problems like this on the website when you uh, look at episode 6 on the website. You'll see not this particular graph, but something like it, and I'll ask questions about function values. Uh, let's see, I guess we've talked about four ways of combining functions. We could uh, add, subtract, multiply, and divide functions. But now, what if we take uh, one more way to combine functions? Let's see, the two functions I had here were, uh, help me out, I think it was 2x plus 3, and the other function was uh, 3x minus 1, is that what I just had? 2x minus 3, 3x plus 1. Uh, 2x minus 3, thank you, and 3x plus 1? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so here's the fourth way of combining functions. It's called the composition of two functions. The composition of two functions. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by taking uh, g of x, and then I'm going to take f of that. So I'm actually taking a function of a function. And this is abbreviated by putting f with a little circle dot g of x. That little 
circle dot there is elevated right in the middle between the G and the F, the F and the G. Now, because G is closest to X, it's the one on the inside. Because F is on the outside, or F is further out, that's why it's on the outside. Now, the way I would evaluate this is I would work from the inside out. I would substitute for G of X, 3X plus 1. And then I would take F of that. Let's see now, F of that, what would it be? Well, over here it says, whatever you plug in for X, you're supposed to double it and subtract 3. So I'm going to double this and subtract 3. And it looks like we're going to get 6X plus 2 minus 3, I think is a negative 1, 6X minus 1. Now compare that with the composition G dot F of X. Generally, when you reverse the order of a composition, you don't get the same answer. So I get G of, and this time F of X goes on the inside, because it's the one closest to the X. And I work from the inside out, so this is G of 2X minus 3. And now what does G do to that? Well, G takes any number and it triples it, and it adds one. So I'm going to have to triple this, and then add one. And this time, I get 6x. Who can tell me what the constant is? Minus 9 plus 1? Minus 8. Minus 8, yeah. 6x minus 8. Uh, they, they look similar, but they're, they're not the same thing. So we don't get the same function. Uh, it's rather unusual when the composition of two functions gives the same answer in the reverse order. Let's go to our last graphic. Well, let's go to, let's go to OK, that, that's fine. Uh, the composition f dot g of two functions, f and g, is defined by the rule f dot g of x is f of g of x. Um, I'll, I'll work one more example here, and then I think we'll have to stop. Uh, this time, rather than picking linear functions, I'm going to pick something a bit, more, a bit more, uh, more involved. Let's say that f of x is equal to x squared plus 2. And let's say that g of x is equal to x over x plus 1. Uh, the first function is a quadratic function. The second function is called a rational function because it's a ratio of two polynomials. I want to calculate f dot g of x. This means, by definition, f of g of x. And now from there, I just substitute for g f of x over x plus 1. So now f goes to work on this rational expression. Uh, what does f do to any number x that I plug in? What do I, what do, I do to the number I plug in? Square it square and add 2 to square it. Square it and add 2. OK, now this time I have a rather complicated thing. I'm going to have to square it and add 2. So that'll be x over x plus 1 squared, and then I add 2. That's going to be x squared over x plus 1 squared plus 2 times x plus 1 squared over x plus 1 squared. You see I'm getting a common denominator here. And now if I combine those and put it over one denominator, uh, let's see, if I multiply that out, that's going to be x squared plus 2 times the quantity. Got to square the x plus 1. x squared plus 2x plus 1. And when I combine those, can anyone tell me how many x squares I'll have all together on top? 3. 3x three squared. Yeah, 3x squared. And then I'll have plus 4x. And then I'll have plus 2. You may or may not want to square this denominator. It, it, uh, it, for, for this purpose, it doesn't really matter if you square it. If I do square that, it would be x squared plus 2x plus 1. Now, that's a rather complicated looking thing, isn't it? And that's the composition of these two functions. If I reverse the order, <clears throat> I'll, I'll try working this in the order g dot f of x. And down here in the corner, I'm going to leave that answer so I can look at it in a minute. This was f dot g of x. I'm going to reverse the order and see how different my answer is when I put it in this order. It's, it's very rare, but it, it, can, it can happen that in the reverse order, you get the same result. But I don't think it'll happen here. I'm going to take g of f of x. 
and that's g of x squared plus 2. Now what does g do to any number in, inside of g? Well, it puts that number in the numerator, it puts that number in the denominator plus 1. So if I put this in the numerator, x squared plus 2, and if I put this in the denominator and add 1, what I get is x squared plus 2 over what? x squared plus 3. Over x squared plus 3. Totally different now. Not nearly as complicated as what I had down here. So when you have a composition of two functions, uh, you have to be very careful about the order that you put them in. Uh, let me just give you an example that's sort of ludicrous, but it uh, pertains to this. When I got up this morning, I put on my shoes and socks. But no, wait a minute. Actually, that's not what I did, is it? Because I put on my socks and then my shoes. The order you do these things makes a difference. If you put a, technically, if you put on your shoes and socks, your socks would be on the outside. So if you reverse the order of those two operations, the operation of putting on your shoes, putting on your socks, you get a totally different uh, outcome. And the same thing uh, holds true for compositions. Now, the order of the functions in addition makes no difference. The order of the two functions in multiplication makes no difference. But it does make a difference in subtraction. It does make a difference in uh, the quotient, f slash g, g slash f. And it makes a difference in the composition. Well, if I could summarize what we've done today, we first looked at, at quadratic functions, and we found how to find the vertex of a quadratic function. Now that's very important because that tells you the extreme value of the function, the lowest or the highest. Then we did the algebra of functions. I'll see you next time. We sort of, uh, yeah, we got Matt Seavers right. I told him about that. <laughs>